Okay, we're now moving on to uh, A6 community presentations. And because we have um, a large number of speakers, um, and I'm just wondering for um, number four and five, do we have names attached? Um, can I have, can somebody bring those names up to me, maybe Jason? I'd like to be able to introduce them appropriately, or Benula. So, because we have so many, Better than nothing. 
Bill 33 uh, does provide some limits in K-7 for class size, and it uh, provides uh, guideline limits, I'll call them, for class composition. When those limits are exceeded, the teacher has the right to a meeting with the principal to discuss the, the class, what it looks like, and there is reporting so that parents, teachers, and public know uh, how many classes are overcrowded. We know now that there are 12,000 overcrowded classes in British Columbia. 2011, <coughs> the Supreme Court uh, of British Columbia ruled that Bill uh, 28 was unconstitutional and gave the government one year to rectify the legislation. Now, the, the letter that was written calls on uh, the government to remove uh, any class composition uh, limits from Bill 33. What does Bill 33 do? Bill 33 does differentiate. I'm not going to say or pretend it doesn't. It does. Uh, so do IEPs. Uh, so, do, so does the entire system uh, of designation. It does identify students. It labels them. Uh, and it does that for the purpose of providing uh, targeted and additional funding and ensuring that classes are organized and schools are organized in ways that can ensure the success of all students. Um, Bill 33 is not broken. Uh, all too many times the limits are exceeded. As I mentioned, we have 12,000 uh, overcrowded classes in BC today. Um, but to remove what we have would be a step backwards. Without Bill 33, students would be clustered, and we've seen this happen. If you have only one EA, the rationale that is most often provided by the principal for putting most of the students with special needs into one classroom is because that's where the educational assistant is, and that's where uh, they would have some support. You know, it's the same argument that was used for secondary 30 schools. seconds. Um, are there problems with Bill 33? Yes. Is the solution to remove it an emphatic uh, no? Uh, simply removing the limits will take us backwards, not forwards. We will have more clustering, more segregation, less teacher time, less success for all students. Um, we ask you to reconsider your position. Uh, the government clearly uh, you know, uh, responded to what you did, and we ask you to consult fully with all partner groups on this issue. Removal of the limits without any guarantees for minimal service levels for students will only worsen the situation that we have today. Thank you. Discrimination, 
but one might assume that you're concerned with negative connotations of this term, that is, with differential treatment based on bias or prejudice. This term also has a neutral definition, however. The recognition and understanding of the difference between one thing and another. It is, in fact, through discrimination that all professionals are able to discern the strengths and challenges of every child in the school system. And it is the knowledge that comes from such discrimination that helps teachers to be successful in motivating and supporting individual students' learning. Educators in industrial countries have fought for the principle of equity since the 1960s. Equity meaning that diverse programs and diverse instructional approaches are needed for children, whether because they have special needs, or because children have different gifts and intelligences, or different cultural background. The esteemed philosopher R.S. Peters argued that equity in education does not mean that children should all be taught the same curriculum using the same methods of instruction. And it is by limiting the numbers of special needs students that all individual students' strengths and challenges can be addressed in a classroom. In BC Teachers Walk picket lines in the 1990s to get equity for special needs students, we did so even though it meant reduced income and pension benefits. We were on side with parents who wanted their special needs children to be integrated wherever their learning could be enhanced by the integration. But we recognize that there needed to be limits placed on the numbers of special needs children to be integrated in any one classroom for the sake of these children as well as the others in their classes. We also needed assurance that there would be education aids for those children who needed one-on-one -on -one assistance. When these changes were implemented, they were applauded by parents and teachers alike. And then, in 2002, the newly elected Liberal government broke this contract and put the system in disarray. After nine years of waiting for a hearing on this broken contract, the Supreme Court of British Columbia ruled that teachers do have the right to bargain for class size and composition quotas, and the ministry was given one year until May 2012 to redress the teachers' grievance. At the time of the ruling, Ms. Minister Abbott said to the press, our priority now is meeting the needs of individual students as we move towards personalized learning while ensuring appropriate learning conditions in our schools and proper support for BC's teachers. Though teachers have yet to receive much encouragement in this regard in their negotiations, May 2012 is not far away. Within this broad context, I will now focus on the situation in School District 61 vis vis the education of students with special needs. During the past six years, I've campaigned twice for a seat on this board, and consequently, I've, paid, seconds. Up, I've paid a lot of attention here are my suggestions. First of all, uh, my understanding for minutes from the fall is that you have $835,000 surplus and you have the authority, the authority to reallocate this surplus. What's needed right now is education aids in this district. Secondly, this morning on the CBC, Education Minister Abbott said that we're all adults, we can sit around the table and solve this problem. My second suggestion is that you ask to have that meeting with the minister, bring in other stakeholders, and personally, I'll volunteer to be in that delegation, pro bono. Pro bono. <laughs> Thank you, Strong. If you have copies of that that you'd like to share with your suggestions, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you.
the incredibly negative impact it has for teachers and students when these class size numbers are exceeded. I'm here to talk, as you can see, with no script on a very personal story, something that perhaps you hadn't heard before, maybe give you some further information to consider. You see, in that 25 years, one of the things I wound up doing a few years ago is I was appointed as an acting uh, administrator. As an administrator, in my administrative role, the contract language was always in the back of my mind. When, as seems inevitable these days, a uh, class in my school had to be exceeding those numbers of designated children in the class, the contract provided an opportunity. You see, what it did is as an administrator, it gave me cause to pause, to think, to collect my thoughts, and to really establish in my own mind what were the educational reasons for creating a class that exceeded those numbers. I knew that conversations would have to be had with the teaching colleague, and I wanted to make sure that I really thought it out. The language in the contract is a boom for administrators, for teachers, and especially for all kids. Some have described the language in the contract as being discriminatory. That, that baffles me. I mean, is extra teaching assistant time for a learning disabled child discriminatory? Is it a free field speaker system for a hearing impaired child discriminatory? Is, is it a visual uh, guide for a visually impaired child discriminatory? I don't know. No, they're not. And neither is the language in this contract. One of the things I've been doing recently is I teach logic to gifted children, another special needs group. And as part of our uh, look at logic, we look at logic in current events. And one child last week bought the story about the letter that went out uh, to the minister. And uh, he said, Mr. Barnes, it's not logical. And he laughed. He said, they're saying here that this will actually, by removing the language, it will help special needs children. He said, Mr. Barnes, that's sort of like trying to do away with high-speed accidents by getting rid of the speed limit. I think he could have perhaps framed it a bit more diplomatically. <laughs> but his logic was flawless. I would urge this board and parents group to please reconsider the information in that letter and hopefully to consider things logically. formula, 
Ministries and the board are held accountable to check in, to report on, and support children with special needs with the proper specialists. If you take away the formula, you take away accountability, and you take away the public's and, and my, as a parent, um, my right to know how my child is doing in our school system. If nurses are saying that a one to four ratio best meets the health and safety needs of their patients, very few of us would question that. If teachers are saying three children with special needs is the maximum that we can handle in order to meet not only their safety needs, but their social, emotional, and academic needs, I would, I would wonder why our professional judgment would be being questioned at all, actually. Um, specifically to the VC pack, as, as a parent and a teacher in the district, like I said, with a child with special needs, it's, it's very interesting to me because um, I'm a part of a group of over 200 parents who I actively um, meet, meet with or know with or chat with, um, and none of us have been surveyed or polled or, or have been contacted by the VC pack to get our views on the current campaign that's been happening to take the language out of Bill 33 that supports our kids. This is doing a huge disservice to, to our children. Many of these families cannot get out to PAC meetings. They cannot get out to BC PAC meetings, and their voices are not being heard. And I don't think it's right for a campaign to be put forth and words to be put in the, in the mouths of people who haven't even had a chance to speak to the issue. And I know that the families that I'm in contact with are in support of teachers having a, a language that keeps their children safe and their needs met in the classroom. So I would encourage you to reach out to those parents, reconsider your position, survey, poll, demand research from the ministry that, that gets current BC um, research out there so that we can see more numbers and, and have a really logical conversation that is supported by research and reported by parents and reported for all the all the kids that are in our school system. Thank you.
the last 10 years came into focus for me, and I realized just how much our education system has been eroded. I urge you not only to rescind your letter to the government, but to listen to the professional, experienced voices who spend each day with your children. We know what we're talking about. Thank you. 
Peter and Wendy Joyce, um, Darcy Dragseth, and Darcy Wingrove. Um, so, um, Wendy, if I could have you come to the podium, please. And before I start, can I just uh, clarify? John had five minutes for his presentation, and he's given me his notes for his presentation, as well as I have my own. Do I now only have five between the two, or do I have five minutes for his presentation, and then I can do my own? Um, I'll put this to the board for there. I believe that you have a uh, PowerPoint presentation between um, the yeah, group. Yeah, so all four presentations are on the same PowerPoint. Um, so, and this is unusual for John to miss anything. So, uh, how does the board feel about just extending that courtesy as we've extended, you know, we've changed the rules anyway for tonight. But is there anybody that's against that? All right, fine. Go ahead, Wendy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm starting off by doing John Bird's presentation for him. So I'm just going to be reading from notes. It can't be very polished, but I'm, I'm going to try to cover what he wanted to talk about. And what he wanted to talk about was the nature of discrimination. And uh, so just to start off, what is discrimination? And I know that's already come up this evening about uh, what people are asking about what that might be or not be. And we're talking about discrimination as being the prejudicial treatment of an individual based on their membership in a certain group or category. It involves the actual behaviors towards groups such as excluding or restricting members of these groups from opportunities that are available to everyone else. In other words, the group suffering from discrimination is treated as inferior and eventually believes that they are. Some of you may be familiar with um, a study that happened um, quite a long time ago, and I know one of our next speakers this evening brought up Dr. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And um, at that time, in response to the assassination um, over, over 30 years ago, a teacher named Jane Elliott devised a controversial and startling blue eyes, brown eyes exercise. Uh, this now famous exercise labels participants as inferior or superior based solely upon the color of their eyes and exposes them to the experience of being a minority. Um, on the evening of April 4th, uh, she turned on her television to find out about the assassination. And the following day, she had a class discussion about it and about racism in general. But she stated, she states, and I could see that they weren't internalizing a thing. They were doing what white people do. When white people sit down to discuss racism, what they're experiencing is shared ignorance. On that day, she designated the blue-eyed children as a superior group. She provided the brown, fa brown fabric collars and asked the blue-eyed students to wrap them around the necks of their brown-eyed peers as a method of easily identifying the minority group. She gave the blue-eyed children extra privileges such as second helpings at lunch, access to the new jungle gym, and five extra minutes at recess. As she observed the students' reaction to the discrimination exercise, uh, it showed immediate changes in their personalities and interaction with each other as early as the first 15 minutes. Those who were deemed superior became arrogant, bossy, and otherwise unpleasant to their inferior classmates. The grades also improved doing mathematical and reading tasks that seemed outside their ability before. The inferior classmates also transformed into timid and subservient children, including those who had previously been dominant in the class. These children's academic performance suffered even with tasks that had been simple before. The following day, she reversed the exercise, making the brown-eyed children superior. While the brown-eyed children did taunt the blue eyes in the same, in a way similar to what had occurred the previous day, she reported that it was much less intense. She then told the blue-eyed the blue-eyed children to take off their collars, and the children cried and hugged one another. The point is that education results um, of this were that students performed to the expectations that were given to them. Now, you probably will have a hard time reading this, but these are a number of beliefs about uh, drive or driving discrimination. And these are some examples. Chinese immigrants paying head taxes in 1885. At that time, BC politicians were concerned by the rapid growth of the Chinese population in comparison to the rest of the population in the province. And they were also afraid of losing the support of the working class who feared competition from this labor. Women getting the vote in 1917, women were seen as intellectually incapable emotional and impulsive to make rational decisions. There was a general belief that politics would be too much for the delicate female temperament. 
1920, of course, we had Jewish students in Canada, where many universities, like McGill, set quotas on the number of Jewish students who were permitted to enroll in those schools. They felt the presence of many Jews tended to lower the tone of Canadian universities. Japanese Canadians being put into camps in 1941. Over a nine-month period, 22,000 people were taken from their homes and scattered throughout BC. The scared people of BC cried out, wanting the BC government to deal with the problem as they saw it, which were the Japanese Canadians. And then in 2006, we talked about the limits on students with special needs. Students with special needs could now be moved from one class to another or another school by deeming the classroom inappropriate for learning. There was no requirement to ensure that adequate resources provided, simply that we moved them around. 30 seconds. Above all, these decisions are based on fear and mistrust. All of them stopped except the last one. Why do we let it happen? You can see the quote here by Carl T. Rowan. When we have our focus on something else like funding, we may not actually appreciate the damage being done. And of course, we know what the effects are. Lack of success, lack of belief in one ability, one's abilities, bullying, social disconnection, anger, frustration, the list goes on. These are long-term effects that change lives forever. How do we recognize discrimination? It's in what we say every day, and these are quotes that we've seen recently on blogs and in, and in newspapers. Adding the special needs student to the mix makes everyone all feel cozy feeling, takes away from the rights of the students to actually have a real need, the need of an education. My children are already stuck in classes with three or more. You can see the list goes on here. All of these statements reinforce, reinforce the concept that students with special needs are inferior. And then you can see at the end there's some quotes that speak for themselves. The important one though is the last one. It may be necessary temporarily to accept a lesser evil, but one must never leave a label a necessary evil as good. Wendy, you need to turn into yourself. <laughs> I'm gonna turn into myself. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. So, Bill 33. We've heard lots of discussion about it. We've all had those discussions ourselves. I'm sure everyone in this room has talked to others about Bill 33. We've all heard what people have had to say, and we've heard lots of public discussion about it. What we'd like to do is talk about some of the myths and the facts about Bill 33. The first one is that Bill 33 is needed to ensure appropriate funding for children with special needs ed individual education plans. The fact is, Bill 33 has never resulted in funding of any kind. Funding for designated children occurs outside of Bill 33, based on designated categories in the ministry's funding formula. IEPs themselves do not result from Bill 33, but are required due to a ministerial order. Myth number two, special needs designations ensure that a child so designated will receive the services that are required. The fact is, designation does not ensure an appropriate level of service. In some cases, it does provide additional revenue to the district, but there is certainly no guarantee that a child's needs will be actually met based on having a designation. Myth number three. Bill 33 puts a cap on the number of students with special needs in the classroom. Fact is, when a class has been allocated more than three students with special needs, a consultation process is triggered that requires a principal and superintendent to ensure that the class is appropriate for student learning. There is no cap. There is no guarantee, it is simply consultation. Number four, it is more difficult to teach a class that has four IEPs than three. It is easier to teach a class that has two IEPs than three. I think this is one that I probably heard the most discussion about um, at talking to different parents and different teachers. And that is that due to the great diversity in the children that receive IEPs, there's no way to measure the challenges without considering each student individually. I'm sure everyone would agree that no child with an IEP is identical to another. Each is an individual with their own unique needs. Therefore, three is not a magic number. And myth number five. Removing a limit of three IEPs per classroom increases the number of IEPs per class. Sorry, the number of three IEPs will increase the number of IEPs per classroom. The percentage of students with IEPs has been stable actually over the last 10 years, before and after Bill 33 was brought in. Classroom averages have also been stable since measurement began in 2005. And if you look at the chart on this page, you may not be able to see it that closely, but you'll notice that IEPs um, across the years from 2001 to 10 have been on average about 10% of the population. And really, this is where we start talking about what we think is the trust in the system, is that we need to trust that with the same number of IEPs, and, and what we're looking at here at the class sizes, they also haven't changed. 
it's about how kids are put in, or how many kids are in, it's about how many kids are in the classroom, not what types of kids are in our classroom. If the workload is too great based on a regular mix of kids, then we should be negotiating class size, not the components within the class. We want classrooms to reflect the mix in our community. And the only way we can do that is by ensuring that classes are not judged based on the components. We <coughs> simply look at the size of the classrooms and we think it's a not a manageable workload. I'm going to pass it on now to Darcy to continue talking about the next section on reframing the issue. Thank you, Wendy slash John. And welcome, Darcy Dryset.
key purpose in BC PAP's constitution is to advocate for the rights of and support the success of every student. BC PAP believes that this goal has not yet been met by our educational system. We are determined to advocate for the resources required to ensure the success of all the students. We are working towards the same goal, perhaps in slightly different ways, but I'm hoping we're going to get there. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is trustee reports. There are senior trustees that uh, have got uh, trustee McAvoy, uh, Edith Wardena, and trustee Norm. So we'll start with uh, trustee McAvoy. Madam Chair, a couple of quick items that's on the schools. The Obey uh, family. Uh, first is an outstanding uh, concert a couple of nights ago from the Obey uh, band. And as well, uh, Trustee Nora and I attended at the uh, Willems uh, Pack Meet. It was uh, a very good opportunity to engage uh, uh, with students. Uh, I would also inform the, uh, uh, my fellow board members and also members of the audience that as president of the British Columbia School Trustees, Association, myself and our vice president, uh, Teresa Rosansoff, met with uh, our Majesty's uh, loyal opposition uh, leader uh, this afternoon, Have a, uh, and along with the uh, education critic for the NDP to talk about uh, education in the province. It was a very good discussion, described as a very frank discussion about, uh, about issues facing us. I regret to say, for those who are in the room and listening, uh, he did not promise uh, bucket loads of money in the event that the, the opposition uh, is elected to uh, the government, but uh, he certainly indicated an indication to uh, want to uh, resolve the, the very challenges that we face in the, uh, in the public education uh, system uh, today. Thank you, Thank you Trustee McAvoy. Uh, Trustee Loring Kahunga, please. I actually... Um, before my trustees report, can I have a point of clarification? I had a couple of questions yes. in regards to all of the presentations that happened. Yes. Um, so first of all, because because I wasn't here for the ops and the education meeting, um, I just want a point of clarification because according to some of the discussion and the letters that have went out, I just wonder how many students with special needs in our school district have been turned away from their neighborhood school because of their special needs. If there are anybody that can answer that, is that something that can be reported back to the trustee? I can report back, but I can also say as superintendent that I've never heard of, uh, of a student with special needs being turned away from the school with their choice, as long as it's in their Catholic area. Uh, and second of all, I'd like to know whether I had asked uh, John um, from VPAC if he had done a financial analysis to take a look at our current funding formula and the way that we get funding and to do a comparative of financial analysis to see whether or not we would actually get more money based on the formula and based on what he is proposing. And I wonder if that has been done. Uh, I think I can... Um Answer that the um, Budget Advisory Committee is working on that, and you may hear some um, interesting news when I get my chair report. Thank you. Because I find it very difficult to accept something that's new if we haven't really taken a look at the financial analysis to see if we're going to be better off or not, and be careful what we think, what we what we uh, wish for, because we know that uh, you know the current government certainly isn't handing down as Trustee McAvoy said, buckets of money for education. Um, so in regards to my report, um, I just wanted to say a couple of things about uh, some of the schools that I've been to. <coughs> um, as, you know, first of all, I want to thank everybody for 
providing so much support to me over the last couple of weeks and you know I as I sit here I know that I should be walking softly as I'm still grieving but it's very difficult when I know that there's so many issues that are coming forward. Um, I have uh, in the last couple of weeks um, had attended Mount Doug Secondary. I also went to Tillicum School. Um, also attended the Pack Bingo at Eagle View and had an opportunity to watch uh, Pack, Pack uh, really working hard at fundraising. Um, other activities that I've attended are the All Nations Education Council um, as a liaison for the board. It was my first meeting and, and uh, much of the meeting was focused on rewriting the enhancement agreement goals for the renewal. Uh, the VPAC meeting, I attended my first VPAC meeting. I also uh, went to the elder George Thomas's memorial service. Um, one of our elders in the Esquimalt Nation who passed away, I went and paid my last respects to the family. And one that I thought was very interesting was Janice's place. As many of you know, Janice um, Edroff was a student in our school district at one time and has now just opened up Janice's place. So on the 22nd of January, I went and attended the open house. And it was amazing to see how many of our students have displayed artwork throughout that entire place. Amazing, amazing art. And, uh, and I'd really encourage uh, all of our trustees to take a look at that place because the artwork is just amazing from so many of our students that are throughout the, all of the rooms and the hallways and all of the sitting areas. Um, so, yeah, so I really encourage everybody to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. I'd like to now call on Trustee Mo. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. I, Chair, I have... I, I, Sorry, can I just hold on for a second? Um, I just want to make mention, I've noticed in the last few meetings that there's been passing of notes from members of the audience to members at the table. And uh, this is a public meeting, and uh, I'd like that to stop, please. And thank you. Trustee Norris, if you continue. Thank you. I have a letter here from uh, another uh, parents and parents who were unable to attend tonight. And I would like to just read one paragraph, if I may, from their letter. <coughs> so these, this is uh, Bobby and John Barry, and they have four sons who have attended Rock Heights. And um, they, when I, when I spoke to them about the issue of, of supporting the classroom and the letter that was sent forward by our trustees, um, they were concerned enough to write a letter, but unfortunately not able to come tonight. But in the final paragraph, they say this. On a personal note, we have a son who has been identified with a moderate behavior slash mental illness learning disability. We are grateful that his particular learning difficulties have been identified along with what can be done to facilitate his learning. However, there are other students with higher needs in his school and in his classroom, and therefore, despite the best efforts of school staff, he is not receiving all the help he requires. It has been a consistent struggle to ensure that he gets the support he is currently getting. Please do not remove the limits on the number of special education students in the classrooms. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, it's been very, very interesting to attend PAC meetings. I, I find that uh, at the school-based PAC, there are many, many parents who are genuinely interested in trying to understand the complexity of the school district and the, the, the school system and the ministry. And when we attended at Willows, um, um, Trustee McAvoy was able to give a very detailed explanation of uh, the new um, high school, Oak Bay High, and they had many really good questions around that. But they also asked about funding. So parents are, they're starting, there's a, there is an awakening in our parents because they are seeing for themselves in the school the impact of lack of funding. And so they asked some questions around how, how do we get funding for EAs? How, what is the funding process? And so there was some discussion around that. And I think that's very useful. And 
And so for that reason, along with many others, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to attend PAC meetings. And finally, just to conclude, um, I would say that one of my remarks to the parents at Lewis was that parent advocacy is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, yes, this government has no intention of putting any more money into public education, and that is a tragedy. They have, Minister George Abbott has said there'll be winners and losers, and that is unacceptable. And so I'm, through our budget process, I am hoping that we can make uh, a very concerted effort, create a strategy to uh, just raise the level of advocacy from our parents, because I think that is going to be central and absolutely significant to the funding issue. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Noor. I'd like to now um, go to Trustee McNally. You do all the microphone and the paper that's stored here. Um, I'm just going to do a, a quick report of, of not not such a, a philosophical statement, although I make those on occasion, but I won't right now. I'm just going to report some things that we did. Uh, Trustee Nora and I did attend the BCSTA and BCPC joint sponsored interest the academy uh, recently in Richmond, and we did find that very interesting. It was quite educational. It was two informative days plus an evening plenary. Um, and the agenda and presentation titles are on the BCSTA website for those who'd be interested in seeing the topics addressed. Um, updates uh, around the negotiations with the BCTF were provided. Um, this was before the staff signed appointments, so that's all we know, I guess. Um, I was appointed board liaison for sex, success by six, and I did report on that before, but I'm board liaison as well as the Healthy Sanitary Committee. And I was actually kind of dreading going to the Healthy Senate Committee, but it turned out to be very interesting. Um, Steve, I don't remember Steve's name, but last name, but Steve is also on the Six Success by Six board, and he was out there to report on some early childhood education initiatives and making sanitary child friendly municipality. And it was actually a fascinating discussion, so I was glad to be there. Um, uh, and I may be getting involved with Swan Lake Christmas Hill Nature Sanctuary along with Trustee Horseman. I'm not quite sure about that part yet, but I would really look forward to it. I lived beside that lake for many years, and it's a local treasure. Uh, planning to attend music by the doctor at the final time. We're really looking forward to that after that amazing Hope Day concert and other concerts I've been to. Uh, all over Canada, it's Pink Shirt Day on February 29th, and I urge everybody to remember the homophobic bullying roots of that Pink Shirt Day. We remember Nova Scotia and two grade 12 boys who wore pink shirts the next day after they said they had had enough of a, a, a fellow student being bullied for wearing a pink shirt to school. March 5th is you big idea fest. That should be fascinating. And I look forward to finally meeting parents at the Esquimalt Pack and Macaulay Pack. We'll attend the Craig Flower Parent Social and Pack, and looking forward to these final high concert bands. Oh, also I'm going to go to Big West Ways That Learn. I mean, that should be actually a lot of fun. Uh, just personally, I was made aware of an Aboriginal education intensive for Camosun staff, uh, given by Camosun Aboriginal staff, and uh, it's really intense. It has uh, an online component and a face-to-face -face component, and I am really big in education now. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Do you want to share anything about uh, previous years on the Big Hot Band? <laughs> <laughs> we played the Cameron Band show, and I played bass. It was the highlight of my life. <laughs> with, with Mr. Andy. With Mr. Andy. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any further trustees that wish to make a report? Seeing that, I'll move into uh, my report, and uh, I will try and just um, summarize. It's been, as a chair, it's become um, my full-time job. I, I love it. It's challenging. It's, um, you know, a lot of research. Um, I think I spend most of my time here. Uh, I have had the pleasure of um, making introductory remarks to a large number of new parents with children who will be entering, entering kindergarten in September 2012. 
It was great to see such energy and interest in our public <coughs> education. Um, I visited with the superintendent, Cecilia Street um, staff, and I attended with um, our vice chair, uh, Trustee Horseman, the principal's meeting. Um, I had the opportunity, along with Trustee Horseman, Alpha, and I believe McNally and Nor, to attend a social with the GDTA and engage in conversation with some of our teachers, high bar. Um, our first bu public uh, budget meeting was held on February 1st at SJ Willis, and while there wasn't a large attendance, uh, the questions and concerns put forward were very thoughtful and actually had a lot of facts backing uh, their concerns. And the notes from these meetings will be added to previous information gathered for our budget deliberations. Uh, another issue of importance to this board um, is uh, our district hosted a meeting on February 7th at the Craig Flower School inviting parents to give their views to the municipalities of Santa Monica, New Royal and New Bridge. This meeting was well attended by both parents and members of the community. Afterwards, we were advised that the questions raised at this meeting were the best that had been received to date. Our facilities director, Seamus Howley, continues to work with both municipalities and will be bringing forward recommendations to the board. Uh, the superintendent and I met with Mayor Fortin on February 10th, uh, 2012 and discussed how we can better work together and we're looking forward to another meeting in the near future. Uh, we are in the process of setting up a meeting with uh, Mayor Niels Jensen in Oak Bay as we want to connect with all of our municipalities and see how we can best work together. Uh, I had the opportunity to be invited to Monterey Middle School to view Ted Harrison's paintings, which I absolutely love. But what was even more <coughs> delightful was, pardon me, when I arrived, I had three grade seven leadership students that were waiting for me, Lauren Quinn and Zoe, that took me to the library where Ted's paintings and his books were. And we had a delightful conversation about his paintings and how somebody can just have that vision. But um, I was more impressed, I think, with the maturity, the eagerness, and the poise these young girls showed to me. They were obviously, and rightfully so, very proud of their school. And I think their school should be very proud of the wonderful ambassadors ambassadorship they showed to me. I attended the Hillcrest Storybook Day, which was wonderful. Staff and students, game bar, uh, were dressed as different storybook characters, and everyone was having a wonderful time. When I arrived, Elaine Dolan, the principal, and along with the student, were handing out cupcakes that looked like spaghetti and meatballs to all the classrooms. The student's mother had made all of the cupcakes for the school, which, even given that she's a caterer, I thought was phenomenal. I didn't get a cupcake. And on Valentine's Day, um, I took my husband to the Oak Bay Band recital. We really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a great way to spend the evening together. There was a silent auction before the performance and during the intermission. And I must report, I was very happy that my husband's kid on the GPS was successful. Because if any, anyone knows me, they know I'm directionally challenged, so this will make my life a lot easier. And trustees McAvoy, McNally, and Norf also attended. Some very good news. Uh, we met with the GBTA on February the 15th to discuss local bargaining, and we will again be meeting this Thursday, the 23rd. My observation, uh, and I think the others from our side of the table, was that it was a very good day, a respectful and healthy discussion and we look forward to the same on um, Thursday. Also on the good news, um, on the advocacy front, which all of us are talking about, um, this morning, John Gateman, Deborah Corbell, and I met with Representative for Children and Youth, Mary Ellen Chappelle, Lebon, and her staff members. I had requested this meeting to ask for her support and cooperation in advocating with us to the Minister of Education for more support for students. I specifically spoke to the need for increased resources for special education. The conversation centered on how to ensure each student receives all the support they require to succeed. It was most encouraging to hear that Mary Ellen made the commitment to continue to speak to the Minister of Education 
regarding our concerns, which she shares around the issues of class size and composition. In addition, Mary Ellen also invited me to meet with her Special Education Advisory Committee to continue the dialogue and further the understanding of the challenges we face in supporting our wide diversity of learners. And this is where our board is not going to be continuing to sit on its hands, but seeking out high profile advocates so that not only the stu students, but the teachers and the educational assistants, um, our ASA, our QP staff are fully supported in the classrooms, um, however that may be. And the discussions need to start happening with all of our educational partners at the, at the table. So it's a start. Uh, I think it's a good start. I will be seeing uh, the minister tomorrow because I'll be attending budget in the afternoon and there's a reception after. I'm not going to buy mull him. However, I, I will take an opportunity to suggest that we need to meet um, as soon as possible um, to further discuss um, the needs and, and uh, with removing the caps, how we support those students and the teachers uh, in the classroom. Um, and that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you. We now move to uh, Diane McNally's motion, F3, I believe, which is recording of votes. And Trustee McNally, if you would like to put forward your motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I can second her. Do I? Yes. Okay, Mr. Butler. Um, in order to be a bit more coherent this time, I've actually written this one out. So I'm going to start uh, and read it. So first of all, I want to address the, the secretarial overload. You know, I do want to be cognizant of, of creating extra work for, for various people who have to back up what I am for. I, I, yeah, I just want to recognize that. Um, I was in the same room as a group of 10, along with a very capable recording secretary last week, and the recording secretary kept up a very fast-moving conversation amongst the 10 people at the table with no apparent problem. Uh, and I did check to see if the secretary was attributing conversational contributions to individuals, and that was occurring. So this is what executive-level secretaries and assistants know how to do, and many other skills that they have. So the recording and attribution didn't slow the conversation down at all. Uh, among the local governance bodies here that we all uh, know, um, the lo local governance bodies that record votes are the Vancouver School Board. I have emailed support from Vancouver to the Vancouver Board Chair, uh, and I specifically asked her about any legal obstacles to implementing recording and any legal difficulties that they may have had as a result of recording. And her reply was that there have never been any legal issues with the record and it has never been contentious. Comox School Board both records votes and videos to their meetings, and uh, they have reported that it does not slow down the meetings or create more work. The CRD records votes, and Victoria City Council, as part of their new open government, open, open government policy, uh, records their votes. So I will close here for my answer. Just for clarification, before we go to the speakers list, your motion, it remains that uh, the mover and seconder will be recorded? The mover sec no. Uh, so? Uh, I, I had actually wondered if, I mean, there was some discussion with various people about that, and if there was an amendment, I would be open to that. So, well, you can amend your own motion when you put it on the floor. Just I'll do that then, sure. Okay, so would you like to read out what your motion um, should be for discussion, please? That all votes will be recorded in the minutes with the trustee's name and yes, no, or abstain. Absent trustee's name, names will be recorded as absent for the vote. Thank you, Trustee McNally. I am now calling on Trustee Ferris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I support the amended motion, and uh, my understanding is that uh, this is something that we can easily accommodate and uh, will provide value to uh, some members of Thank you, Trustee Ferris. Um, I'll go to Trustee Alpha. I 
I'm speaking in favor of this motion. Um, I think that as, as has been said before, many public bodies are now doing this, are recording votes and reporting them out in the minutes. I think that in a time where government is being asked to be more transparent, that includes school boards. So I'm strongly supporting this motion because I think it does help with transparency. Thank, thank you, Trustee Alpha. I'm sorry, I was just um, clarifying something with the Secretary Treasurer. I apologize. Um, I'd like to um, now ask uh, Trustee Lauren Kalunga to speak. Thank you, Chair Orchiton. Um, I'm also speaking in favor of the motion. Um, I believe in openness, transparency, and accountability to our electorate. I believe wholeheartedly in that. And I feel that as elected officials, that we must be accountable to the public who voted for us. We represent them at the table, and I don't see this as old trustees versus new trustees, nor do I see it as just plain politics, as some have alluded to. I see this as part of our democratic society, and it is my responsibility to ensure that I am accountable for my decisions. The public should not have to wait for three years to hold me accountable. Thank you. Uh, Trustee McAvoy. I had a couple of comments. I just actually had a, a question. Uh, not, I guess perhaps it's to the mover. When we say all votes, um, I mean, technically we vote on our agenda, we vote, and I presume we don't mean to take a roll call on, on agendas and adjournments, that sort of thing. Is that, I get that right? That's the intent of the motion, Trustee McElroy. If you'd like to make an amendment to uh, say perhaps substantive motions, I'd be fine with that. Do you feel uh, that's I, don't, I don't think that's necessary. I think the chair can probably take his, his guidance. Uh, and, and there may be other motions that we, we vote to thank so and so or whatever. I, I wouldn't see any purpose in doing roll calls and that sort of thing. But clearly, the, the intent is to deal with substantive items, which I, uh, I, I would support uh, the resolution, actually. Um, but I, I would also like to, at the same time, pay some uh, deference to some of uh, the predecessors that have served on this board, whether it was uh, George Jay or Margaret Jenkins or Frank Hobbs or Carol Pickup, who's a previous chair, or Carol James, who led this board. I would think, and they would say, no doubt, that they led very transparent boards, uh, very democratic boards, very accountable boards to their community. And I can say, uh, quite clearly here in this room that on major items where this board has, in my 10 years experience, has had some difficult items to grapple with, I can assure you, people were very clear on how I voted. I can also tell you I have the wounds to show for some of those, uh, some of those efforts. So uh, in terms of transparency, I've, uh, this uh, to me, uh, I, I don't have any difficulty with, and I suspect if you ask previous chairs like James and pick up and so forth, they would say, well, people look at the minutes to see what the business of the board was and what they did, and uh, they would see if the motion was carried and so forth. That said, I think there's some value in, uh, in having people's uh, names attached to the vote. It's not without precedent, by the way. I would remind the board members who have been around for several years that on some major issues like school closure, uh, if you look in the minutes, you will see that those votes, uh, I think back in 2003, were, were actually recorded. All of those votes were recorded for uh, a posterity. Um, I would also note uh, that, uh, that in fact, uh, we would, I think, maybe Trustee Ellering Kuhunga uh, indicated, we would, I think, probably be maybe the third board in, in British Columbia to, uh, to have recorded votes. Uh, two others that I'm aware of. Uh, other boards will note sometimes negative votes. I note that uh, Trustee uh, Lorraine Kuhunga's uh, previous board, Saanich, uh, I'm not sure that they uh, actually record their votes, but who knows, this may become part of a, uh, a trend that picks up some, uh, uh, some uh, saliency around the rest of the province. The other thing I would say about this, in terms of transparency, is it, is it, uh, uh, transparency is not just putting names down on a piece of paper. It's, it's about our collective responsibility, and I'm gonna just turn around, if I may, for a moment, and uh, talk to some of our colleagues. And I know uh, um, the Times columnist recently, and Lindsay Hines has been here, and Black Press is here on a, I would say, a, a more sporadic basis. But I think it's all of our responsibilities as, uh, as 
representatives of organizations, if you're DC PAC and UDTA, to take that information back to uh, members. And for the media to be here, I would say, on, on a hopefully a more um, a regular basis, to report to the public. I think that's how we become even more transparent, beyond just uh, putting names on a piece of paper, which I think is important. So I'd like to thank and the mover of the motion and bring this forward and, and uh, say that I was supported wholeheartedly. Thank you, Trustee McAvoy. Are there any further speakers? Trustee Horseman, are you still awake? I'm here. Uh, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, I would just add that in my opinion, the previous, uh, in agreement with what Trustee McAvoy just said, in my opinion, the previous boards were very clear about what they wanted to vote for. But I will be supporting this motion because it is apparently the modern age to record them and have them accessible by computer. So I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you, Trustee Horseman. I'm passing the gavel over to you, so to speak, because uh, I just want to make a comment as well with respect to um, this motion. Um, we talk about common sense, which unfortunately is not as common as we would like. Um, I would see this as um, that we would record votes when there's two motions, you know, not to you know, uh, accepting the agenda, you know, adjournment, those sorts of things. It's, it's, it's the motions that are brought forward, um, you know, that the record should reflect um, what's happening. And I agree with Trustee Loring um, Kahunga about the old guard versus the new trustees. And I certainly, uh, I don't know where that came from. I think that it was, it was um, there from the media. I think that as a board, we work together, and there's value in every uh, everything that is brought to the board by every member. Um, whether you're a new trustee or a seasoned trustee, um, everyone has value that they can bring to the debate and discussion. Um, as Trustee Horstman said, it, you know, if this is what the public wants, if they see this as being the way to be transparent. And we believe we've done, and we know by research that we haven't done anything wrong in the past. Um, and we've had uh, recommendations from uh, registered parliamentarians and reading Robert's Rules of Orders. And I'm very happy that Trustee McNally uh, removed the requirements for um, recording the mover and the seconder because those can be very misleading if someone were to look at it. Um, having said all of that, I'm just going to cut off but I'm, anything further and just say I'm, I'm happy to uh, support this motion. It's something that I practiced in principle um, ever since I've been elected, so I don't see a problem with this. I'll exercise my right slash responsibility to record um, my votes. Thank you. And thank you to Diane for bringing this forward and with the amendment. Are there any further speakers to the motion? Trustee McNally, do you have any comments for clo to close? I believe I've made my thoughts clear about this. I don't need to close things here. Okay, then I would uh, ask all of those in favor to raise clearly raise their hands and keep their hands up. I um, wow, have we got a unanimous vote? Do we need to record when it's unanimous, or can we just record it as unanimous? Oh, isn't that nice? And that's easy, George. There you go for the first one. Okay, so um, moving on, or moving back, I should say. Um, We are now going on to uh, Section C, uh, the Education Policy Development Committee, um, and on to Trustee Alpha. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to go into here in great detail because we have a number of motions coming forward um, this evening. Um, and I'm just going to refer you to our minutes on page 14 and make the comment that we had um, an excellent presentation from 
that um, Judy Moss brought in with Valen Marshall and Susan Simons on the Black History Awareness Society and the web page that they're developing for use by educators. Um, I learned a lot about the history of black people um, in our province, and I think this will be a valuable resource for, for teachers so and for students. So um, you can read that over. The marine biology um, piece have, um, was reviewed. Mr. Dave Thompson brought, the principal of OPE brought um, forward a request that we change it from biology 11 to marine biology 12. And uh, we carry the motion, but we're bringing it to the board. And I would like to move that motion for approval by the board at this point, please. Sir, is there a seconder? We have a seconder. We don't need a seconder. We don't need a seconder at committee and at when this has come out of committee, my apologies. So is there any discussion on the recommended motion uh, that we uh, rename Marine Biology 11 to Marine Biology 12? Seeing uh, well, I, I would like to say that I, uh, I would like to congratulate the staff at uh, Oak Bay High School for such a well put together course. And it, uh, it's apparent that uh, both grade 11s and grade 12s will be welcome to take the course, but they'll get grade 12 credit for it, and uh, I think uh, it's a very, very impressive course. Thank you, Trustee Horseman. Are there any further comments? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Um, wow. Okay, George, another easy one for you. That yeah, was a uh, unanimous vote. Thank you, trustees. Uh, we'll now move on to C2. Just one, one little bit. Um, we also had a presentation follow-up on the story of Oak, which is an interesting um, video that was presented by a member of the public. And um, administration is going to review the video and just make a decision as to whether it's going to be a web-based resource that will be recommended by the district, but as was pointed out at the meeting, many people are already aware of um, the story of work and the story of stuff and music in their in their classes. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Alpha. Uh, Trustee Leonard. Thank you. Uh, we had a very busy meeting and a big agenda for, for our ops meeting. Um, I'm going to uh, just go right to the first recommended motion. I'm going to do from the order number one, then number seven, and then the, the middle five, because that's sort of how they break down. Um, the first um, motion was brought to our attention to make sure that all trustees could be at the final budget meeting. Um, we were tweaking our dates by two days, and so this motion was put forward and carried at the office meeting for the consideration tonight. Thank you. Are there uh, any comments? Anybody that wishes to speak to us? Trustee McAvoy. I'm happy to say thank you to my colleagues for uh, putting this forward. Thank you. Are there any further comments or Trustee Nora? Um, I will be voting for this motion because I have had numerous parents ask me to consider extending the period between um, the budget presentation and some del deliberation time. Uh, I, I'm sorry, you're saying you're not supporting this motion. Okay, thank you. Are there any further? Sorry, I just, just to clarify, so uh, do I take from what you're saying, you're not opposing uh, so much the moving from a Wednesday to a Monday, you're thinking it should even be moved further out in the future? Okay. Seeing no other speakers, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, keep your arms up, please, because this is not, okay, um, George, can you write down the initials of those that are in favor, please? You're going to have to come up with a little ticky box. <coughs> well, I think we'll start, we'll, we'll make up a sheet, but for the time being, are you supporting, Diane, are you asking a question? Wait, you're not. This is your motion. 
This is yeah. Hold your hand up if you're in support. And uh, Bev is already supported, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, five, six. Yep. Okay, you. all of those uh, opposed? One, two, three. You got the initials there? So the motion is carried and uh, so ordered. Thank you. So we're going to motion number seven. Um, we had um, Shana Talley, uh, Director of Facilities, talk to us and heard some feedback from some of the trustees that had attended the meetings at Craig Flower School. And um, it was brought out at that meeting that it was Saanich staff who were directed to come up with how the students were going to cross the water. And so um, we just didn't want to let staff decide. We wanted to bring the politicians into the decision. So to make sure that their politicians knew how we felt and wanted to hear our voice about what was our preference to crossing the water. So we asked the um, chair to write a letter to Sanich with our preferred choice for crossing the water, and that's where this motion came from. Thank you, Trustee Leonard. Are there any comments or questions? Trustee Norm. Just as a point of clarification, so what specifically are we recommending? The floating bridge. The floating bridge. Did, did you want to? No, you know. Okay. Are there any further questions? Excuse me, what, the clarification for that was that we are recommending the floating bridge? The, the footbridge. Footbridge. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's also um, the, walking bridge. the walking bridge, the pedestrian. Right. And there may be some need of some, um, I think the letter can reflect small busing. We're in the process of writing that letter. Um, right, the discussion was that the letter would reflect what our community wanted and the school communities wanted, as opposed to, well, just what we wanted. We wanted the council to know what we wanted as a district. Instead, yeah. Instead of staff recommending to Santa's council what they do. Exactly, and as I said, uh, the staff from San and New World that were there were very impressed with the uh, high degree of, um, you know, the questions that were asked and the concerns that were raised from both the parents and the community. Yes, Trustee Norm. Just one more question. I know that one of the playgrounds needs to be moved, and so my question is, will Craig Flower have to pay for the installation, or is it covered through the amount? Any of these enhancements will um, are being negotiated with, um, as I said in my report, our director of facility, Seamus Holly, is in negotiations, um, and uh, I don't think he has anything further to report. So at such times, he will he'll be making recommendations for the board to consider. We'll be looking to maximize whatever we can for our school there. Okay. So seeing no further speakers, I'll call the questions. All those in favor, raise your hands. Oh, we have another unanimous. <coughs> you guys are getting off easy. George and Vicki. Motion. Motions two through six. Um, if the board, if it's their pleasure, because we have lots of things to come, but we could move them as a block if no one has any questions on them. They are um, district leadership team bringing forward each month housekeeping items, so to speak. They are just updating our policies and regulations, and these are all policies that they have not changed the intent of them, but just brought them into the year that we're in, as opposed to being 1979, 1991. They brought them into current practice for us by tweaking um, school district to board of education, items like that. So if there were no questions, we could move it forward to block or we can do them one at a time and I'll take direction. Diane, uh, Trustee McNally and then I will pass the uh, gavel, so to speak, over to Beth um, to ask her question. Yeah, so thanks. Um, the only one I see here that I could actually um, Pass right now would be the Perks Clinic funding because Perks Clinic that it's an obsolete policy. 
Now the others do have some problematic parts for me. Um, Can we do this one at a time then? Let's do one at a time. Okay, number two. Um, develop, uh, form a committee to develop a policy on building school culture with a set of guiding principles for schools to follow. So, um, rationale is about to we have thorough discussion on all of these, so that's there for uh, the board's consideration. Uh, Trustee McNally. So I think it's part of the former committee, and uh, I either I can't remember or it was never clarified uh, what, what the protocol for forming the committee would actually be. Can anybody uh, clarify that for me? Because if it's not in place right now, um, clearly understood as part of this motion, and we need to talk about that one. Uh, I believe that this came out of the um, Educational Partners uh, Council. Um, and uh, that it, this was going to deal with a number of issues and we were going to be drawing on our public partners as well um, and dealing with issues of when we talk about uh, building school culture with a set of guiding principles it would be inclusive of uh, our bullying uh, bullying initiatives and that sort of thing uh, the superintendent can probably add uh, more to that because he's on you know, he's part of that uh, working group. If I understand the question correctly, you're wondering about how the the, uh, the committee is actually formed? Yeah, basically, who's going, if there's going to be a vetting process for who's on it and what the process will be. Uh, when we form committees, we, we uh, send invitations to all of our stakeholders asking them to bring people onto the committee. Uh, there might be some people that have a uh, a real interest in this policy that we might seek out and tap on the shoulder if they would like to join us as well. Uh, but other than that, it would uh, be going up each of the stakeholder groups. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent and Trustee Norm. Just one more question. I'm wondering if we will be setting aside some funding to support this or are we going to um, make every effort to have these meetings outside of the school? My my understanding, and this that the superintendent can add to this if I've missed anything, is to minimize any cost to the district. Um, so, you know, having meetings and evening if we can, uh, doing everything we can to minimize that, yes, because communities uh, can be costly if we're, especially, we want to have our school um, staff involved, and then there's, re you know, uh, replacement costs and those sorts of things. So. Did you want to add anything more to that? Did you have something further, Deborah? I was just thinking that perhaps we should consider that there might be a need to, for instance, EAs, if we wanted to have some of our groups like that, our EA employees um, be part of the discussion. I think we have to be doing um, school time. I think the superintendent and, and then uh, Trustee Leonard might I suggest that we might be a bit premature. This is this is often a, an issue that we run into. Uh, parents who work during the day can't take off time from their regular work to be there. And uh, our friends in 947 and 382 would prefer that we, we held it during school time. And we'll try to work something out and then bring it back to the board for some advice. Trustee Leonard. Um, just the discussion at the board table was we asked if there could be uh, some kind of costing, if there was going to be costing brought to us, and we were assured that prior to it going ahead there would be some kind of costing so that we would know if there was going to be any, any finances involved and what they could possibly be. Thank you for that clarification, Trustee Leonard. Are there any further speakers to uh, this motion, to this recommended, recommended motion? Seeing none, um, I'll ask um, all those in favor. Aye. We have a uh, unanimous. Another huge one. Just because we've got it. Trustee Leonard, uh, number three on our docket here is that um, 
We adopt revised policy 2221 department heads for secondary schools. So again, it was just cleaning up the language. It wasn't changing how department heads are handled at each school, and each school, we were sure, does do it differently, so it was just cleaning up the language. Trustee McNally and uh, Tara would like to speak. So uh, I recall thinking about this and reading it and discussing it and having a way feeling that uh, what we were left with really should be dealt with at the bargaining table. It, it is issues that affect our employee teachers and uh, so I'm, I'm not um, thinking that this is why I can support uh, being in favor of here. I would recommend that it be sent back to OPS, I guess, for consideration. I mean, we need to consider it, so I don't know where to send it. Pardon? I'm changing any of the words. All right, well, I'll just have to say I'll, 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 I can't support it. The superintendent would like to make a response. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tara, you still are on the list, but just... These are, um, um, what we're trying to do is just update them. If there's something more that we have missed, just send it back to us and uh, we'll bring it forward again. It's not, uh, it's not something that has to be completed tonight by you. So, it's not, it's not an issue. Uh, Tara. Uh, thanks. You know, we did have a look at this, and um, I don't believe it's wording that is consistent with the collective agreement, so I would suggest that uh, it would be a better process to uh, have it come to us um, for discussion uh, prior to changes. So what we're suggesting is that it will go back through DLT and to connect with, collect, uh, with um, the union to make sure that we're not messing with the collective agreement language. Um, I'd like to. <laughs> we want to make sure it's nice and clean and that we're not creating more grievances unnecessarily. Um, are there any further comments or questions with respect to? Actually, Elaine, I'm sorry, but you're supposed to be doing all of this. Work. We're going to, um, I think it's going to. Like it. It'll come back through eventually. When it's vested. Number four, the Board of Education, number 61, Zinc Policy 6172, GR Kirk's Clinic Funding. It was a redundant policy. It no longer, GR Kirk's Clinic Funding no longer exists, so we were just removing it from our book. It, Elaine, it's your, your. It's on the floor, so. You, it's, no, it's yours. I shouldn't be, you're the chair of this. No, no, you still have to call for the votes and everything. All I do is present. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from anybody? Uh, seeing none, I'd like to call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. We have another unanimous vote. Uh, oh, I, I didn't ask for a pose, but you know, yes. uh, common sense prevailed that when it's unanimous. I wouldn't ask for an, an opposition vote. Okay. Just for clarification, I do know. Number five, that the Board of Education School District 61 adopt the revised policy 2105 district leadership team. I believe we did go back and forth and wordsmith it a tiny bit just to make it clearer. And this is um, what we came up with at the end. I see, I see uh, Trustee Lauren Kahunga and Trustee Knorr. Uh, Trustee Lauren Kahunga first, please. Thank you. Um, so when I went through this, I, I see this as much more than wordsmithing when I go through it and I see that so much of the intent seems to even be missed. Like, uh, you don't have a problem as I expressed previously about not having a strategic plan within the district and I see that if we're just reacting to the goals and objectives within the achievement contract and the enhancement agreement, that we're really just reacting rather than proacting. So I have an issue with that. I also have an issue with, you know, when I look at this, it seems to move the shift from 
the board um, given direction to the staff and now the staff is giving direction to the board. So that's the second issue. And the third issue I have is I wonder whether it's in, um, in any way contrary to what our collective agreement states. So I would be voting again. Uh, trustee Mark, I would vote we just refer this back. Uh, I mean, these are meant to be, uh, as I understand it, these are, are cleaning up uh, learning mm -hmm. and so forth. So if there are substantive concerns or we need to redo that mm -hmm. policy period, then uh, unless I'm missing something, I just, is, the, is this the proper forum for hearing? Uh, if I could just jump in here, these questions were discussed. Were discussed. All of, all of the questions that um, Edith has brought up were discussed at the meeting, so if um, they need to be vetted through the meeting again and um, you the want to ask them at the next meeting, you can. Because they were all discussed and... Those questions were answered. The they were at the time, yeah. And the rationale was given for why the language is as it is. So are we moving for, oh, Trustee North, sorry. So just having an opportunity to think about it since our ops meeting, um, I wondered in the second paragraph that was struck, uh, it says that the Board of School Trustees of School District 61 directs the superintendent of schools to submit all regulations pertinent to the job descriptions of the members of the district leadership team. So I, I noticed that, of course, we have a superintendent job description um, and this associate superintendents, but I'm wondering where there's other, where are the other job descriptions? They're in the, you mean the secretary treasurer? Or, or, or department, uh, people that are uh, like I, yeah, department head for IT or um, the principal um, of special education. I, I prefer that one through superintendent to uh, associate superintendent, Sherry Bell. Through the chair. We, um, currently, uh, department heads and um, DLT are looking at all the job descriptions um, and updating them as well. Does that help, or Deborah? So I'm, I'm at the mercy of the board here. We can refer it back and go through it again, or we can just put it to the vote because it's not something that has to be unanimous. There were seven trustees that was meeting that the chair can make that decision, or you can ask a show of hands. Um, I think we can put it to a, um, a vote. It was, you know, discussed, and, and if there's further questions on this, that certainly um, Trustee Lori Kahunga can can get follow up on those questions. And unfortunately, you weren't able to be at that meeting. And I think you'll be satisfied with the answers. So I'll put the question to uh, the trustees. Those in uh, favor of this. Yeah. Literally. 
We're looking at, at, at uh, number six under the ops that the Board of Education at School District number 61 Greater Victoria adopt the revised policy 2115 Associate Superintendent. Page 43. Are you okay? You're, you're there? Uh, Trustee Noor. I'm wondering if I could call on Mr. Painter to just give us a review of the, of the definitions and distinction between um, responsible and accountable. Because, because I'd like to know and I'd like to consider. Actually, uh, that would be out of order to ask a member of the public to, to um, provide that information. We do have people that that's their job. So then I, I will be voting for it because I think it deserves a second one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee uh, Lauren Galina. So um, thank you, Chair. So just making sure we're on regulation, we're on policy 2115. Yes. Right? Along with the regulation. So again, I have the same problem that again, we're removing strategic planning from everything. And I just have a real problem with that. At least my strategic or my regulation 2115 under specific responsibilities 1.0 um, with strategic planning, um, achievement contract, and the Aboriginal Enhancement Agreement is replacing that and all through the document. So, so I um, will vote against it for the same reasons of why I voted against the other one. Just for, just for clarification, Trustee. Uh, we're only voting on the policy, the regulations, which uh, is how we uh, apply the policy, are not changing. If that makes any difference to the way you vote, there's no changes to the regulations, just the policy. There are. No, there are. There are. The regulations are for information. Sorry, that the, regu the regulations have changed, but I heard, but they're not voted on. The motion they come to us for information only. That's right. So the only thing we're voting on is page 43. That's right. They need to be voted because they are the umbrella for the regulation. Exactly. And Trustee Horseman, did you want to? Yes. Okay. Yes. Trust, trust. I just want to say that uh, it's not without, it's not outside the realm of possibility that the board would engage in strategic planning in the future, but it would have to be put together as a pa uh, package for the budget and be approved because strategic planning is a very expensive um, uh, undertaking. So, you know, if um, trustees want to see the board do that, uh, then a package should be worked on and, and put it forward as, as part of the budget space. Uh, but taking it out of this particular policy does not mean that we would not engage in strategic planning in the future. Trustee Lori Just in response to Trustee Horseman's uh, comments, to me, policy development is long term. It's not only currently looking at our needs right now and the way we're doing business, but it's around looking at our future needs as well. And so if we remove strategic planning from there, where is, so right now, we, yes, we do have the enhancement agreement and we have the Aboriginal achievement, uh, the Aboriginal enhancement agreement and achievement contract, but I see that as so reactive. And I feel that really policy in our school district, we really, why we're going through all of these right now is because practice is not following our current policy. So if we're really going to be serious, let's look at the future needs of our district as well as current and, and adapt our policy to meet those needs so that we're not back doing the same thing in a couple of years. Just a point of clarification, we're actually changing the policies to re reflect our current practice. Current practice yeah. mm -hmm. Are there any further speakers to this motion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, all those opposed? Trustee Lauren Kalinga and Trustee Norm. Thank you. <coughs> so, we'll now move on to the superintendent has no report this evening, so we're moving on to D2. Secretary Treasurer's report. Uh, George, it's, it's uh, all yours. <coughs> 
Thank you, Madam Chair. It's the time of year, every year in February, we bring forward a bit of a forecast of where we're going to go uh, with, with our fiscal year budget, uh, leading into the next part of where we need to pass motions and bylaws relating to our revised operating budget for this year. The first chart is one where we've been showing it over the past years. The pink line on the top indicates what our cost to educate a student is on a per, per student basis for each of the years shown going back to 2003. The dashed line underneath, which doesn't never quite meet that uh, pink line, is the amount of our operating grants that we get. Uh, each year we have to find savings some way, some place, and other things in order to match, uh, to allow us to have a balanced budget. This gap is really part of our structural deficit, and this year it's over $8 million. So we have to work hard and continuously work and look at ways of saving money to, to come up and keep that gap closed where we can maintain a balanced budget. Doing our work at this point in time, we've gone through and reviewed all revenue and expense line items in our budget for the year, and we're still projecting because it goes, our fiscal year is from July 1st, 2011 to June 30th, 2012. So obviously we don't have actual expenses for all of February, March, April, May, or June. So, however, we project, according to this, an operating budget surplus as a result of the items that we show up here. So how do we get this projected one-time carry-forward number? Well, last year-end, as of our fiscal year-end, the board, knowing that fiscal year 12-13 would cause us some problems, would be in a deficit situation, the board approved in September the moving of the dollars left over from last year, the $835,000, to be carried forward to the 12-13 budget. So that amount was approved by the board the last September. In December of 2011, as part of the provincial holdback release for each year when the September 30th counts come in, uh, the budget, or the provincial budget for education is reallocated based upon the number of actual students and all the various items, various areas. We received $2,474,000 in additional funding. We reported that to the board in the letters, I believe talked about it at the January meeting in passing. We also have, that's new funding, one-time funding that we really can't bank on because it depends on provincial estimates. The additional revenue is consists of several sources of additional revenue. We receive a credit from the Bank of Montreal for using our district credit cards. So rather than giving us discounts and everything else, because we're a collective, the Bank of Montreal gives us money. We buy all our office supplies for bunk office supplies. They give us a rebate. These are things that we negotiated when we went to tender. And we also have better interest rates. And because we receive the chunk of money all at, all at once, uh, haven't had a chance to spend it with higher interest rates, we received additional interest income. So that amounts to our additional revenue of $280,000. The next large amount of $890,000 relates to our benefits. Our benefits for dental, for uh, drugs, those types of benefits are really not an insurance plan. We're what's called uh, a cost plus basis, or the technical insurance terminology is an ASO basis. So if we don't utilize those dentist calls, we don't buy all the drugs that the actuary <coughs> told us to expect, because these are our cost estimates are based upon actuarial evaluations done by the consulting firms. If it's not a bad flu season. There's not a lot of people going to the drugstore. There's not a lot of hard candy breaking fillings in your teeth. Um, our actual costs are lower. So these are cost savings to the board. So it's lower than we budgeted. The next item is decreased average teacher salary. When we create a budget, 
we estimate, we come up with an average teacher salary for the year. Uh, the average teacher salary turns out to be what we get, so we're doing this estimate in February, March, and then we come along to September, October, and we see what we actually hired. This obviously is indicating that we have a lot more lower echelon teachers, or lower on the pay grid. That saved us some money. The decreased absences, that's straightforward. That's actual <coughs> sick leave utilization. Our sick leave is down versus what it has been, versus what we budgeted for. So that's for teachers in QP382 and exempt staff. Our, our salary, our sick days are down, saving the district money. Unfilled positions, we talked, we named some names in the in-camera session, that's the only thing that we talked about. But these are people not being replaced on an ongoing basis. The, the majority of those were in the management side that we haven't filled that position because we're trying to see if we can get along without it. And so those were costs built into the budget for this year that we didn't utilize, and therefore we can free that amount of money up. <coughs> Excuse me. The next item, of the trustees heard about parts of this when Mr. Scott, who's here tonight to answer other questions if need be, uh, talked about having come up with additional students this year. He brought in more students than we have built the budget upon. And therefore, he has increased profitability from bringing in those extra students. And he also has had some his, or we treat his separately, but he's had some leave of zap, leaves of absence, uh, maternity leaves, those types of things where his staff hasn't been replaced, their staff savings in there. Because the staff hasn't been replaced, they haven't traveled as much as uh, a savings there, but you have to carry on traveling in the future or else you lose those businesses. We're having uh, additional success from companies such as Mexico because parents now don't want their child just to be in Canada for one year, but perhaps two or three years, which saves us the, the repeat ongoing costs of those types of things. And we're getting more into the way we can schedule things as, as groups. And um, having done now in some of these countries many years, Dave has developed a good network of people to, to keep feeding us these on an effective basis. Uh, so that generated the $680,000. The second largest number on here is in the departmental budget savings. We all knew, the board especially knew, that the 2012-2013 budget season was not going to, we did not believe it would be a pretty picture, that we have a structural deficit uh, that we've been fighting for years. The structural deficit is in excess of $8 million. Uh, so, Department heads were all asked to consider items that they could defer, not spend. What could we do to save money in order to avoid layoffs? So things, HR doing, doing some of their items on, on some of the training. Uh, Seamus in facilities delayed purchasing large equipment for, for at least a year. Those are the types of things that we, we've delayed. In the superintendent, assistant superintendents, associate superintendents, departments, um, what they've done because they're responsible for a lot of the professional development monies in those accounts because of the teacher job action couldn't be spent. So we, we have those monies left over, including some of the supplies for, for those types of items. So some of those funds we're unable to use because of that, but all the departments we went through and um, came up, scraped all the budgets, and came up with this kind of a savings. Going through in the last item on here for $380,000 is in our utilities and waste management. Previous boards made hard decisions about what to do and how we came up with our money. A previous board made a decision that we would take some money and invest in some capital costs. The capital being uh, working with our QP382 group to put in energy efficient light fixtures, more efficient boilers, uh, replace the lights in the LED, uh, with LEDs. These, the, the object at that point in time when we created this program several years ago was to start generating returns, start generating savings. We're still utilizing money to carry on the program, but 
this year we were saving for future years. This year we're, we're going to start seeing some of those savings. Another interesting thing uh, is a byproduct of one of the board's other initiatives. The board voted and strongly supported a greening commission, committee, a greening initiative. One of the areas that we're actually seeing some reasonable savings on now is because of this greening committee in that we're using smaller garbage bins at schools that are being picked up less frequently, that in turn generates us money. So you add up all of this, and it adds up to $8.6 million worth of one-time projected savings. It's a great number, but remember, the next slide, we actually have, we talked about it, we, we have a deficit, we have a uh, fundamental, not enough money in our system. So there's the $8.6 million we talked about a minute ago. By going through all of our expenditures based upon projection, projected enrollments, our best estimate of costs to come in the next year, excluding salaries because we're told it's a 0% mandate, nobody gets a salary increase unless you're moving through the grid. Um, and maintaining status quo in all of the, the other programs. Um, and for Deborah and I's sake, I have to throw in another proviso. The funding doesn't get released until March 15th. We believe we know what the funding will be that will match this year as we use the ministry's funding projector, projection tools. So we believe using all that information, we'll have an $8,289,000 deficit. You put those two numbers together, we are anticipating that we'll have a one-time this year um, surplus of $350,000. So that's what we will be bringing forward in a budget when we bring forward the details in a few weeks, assuming that our other estimates are right. To put it in perspective, $350,000 sounds like a lot of money, and it is. However, it's 0.02% of the total budget. Uh, it's one-fifth of one percent. So tonight, you will be asking the board for motions. This is the starting point. Uh, the next motions coming up will be the, the starting point for next year's budget. We have to get an understanding of where this June 30th we're going to end up with before we can start with next year. If the board decided that uh, we want to spend $8.6 million between now and June 30th and not have this one time carry forward, we could do that. But then we would have to start cutting $8.6 million out of the next year's budget. So the, the staff is recommending that we would appropriate this $8.6 million surplus from the current year and move it forward so that we can build the budget with a $350,000 surplus. And that there would be other recommendations of how we should spend that $350,000 surplus. Madam Chair, we're staff is here to answer any questions. Are there any questions or? <laughs> Uh, uh, Trustee McNally. I'm sure this doesn't reflect the efforts of our Secretary Treasurer and senior staff to explain this budget process and budget to me, but I have too many questions to agree without three readings tonight. I, I need another meeting. I need to ask some more questions. I need to think about um, the implications of carrying forward and money now and what to do with the budget surplus. Um, I, just, I feel really rushed by agreeing to all three readings tonight. Trustee, uh, my board, before, just to, uh, the Secretary of Treasury would just like to, I think, respond to Trustee McNally. Just, just, you're not approving next year's budget tonight. We're not asking to approve next year's budget. We won't do that until April. Tonight, what we're doing is, according to ministerial orders, we have to approve the revised budget for this fiscal year by the end of February. 
what we're doing with these slides is showing you where we think this fiscal year is going to come in. And on the basis of where this fiscal year will end up with an $8.6 million, with an $8.6 million carry forward, we will then be able to build the budget for budget discussion around the table and with the public in March and April to pass a proper budget in April. This is not to pass the budget tonight, it's only to pass the revised 2011-2012 budget. Which is required. Trustee Mac or Trustee Mac or Trustee Leonard and Trustee Lauren Kahunga. Sorry, actually, there was a further question that I had uh, about that. So, uh, in terms of the requirement to actually approve this amended budget, when is, does the ministry expect, or when do we are we required to report that to the ministry by February 29th? Yeah. And. Uh, Uh, I suppose one option to the board is to uh, is to spend some of that money now. Is that the idea? Is there, I just want to be clear on what uh, I mean. I'm not advocating that. In fact, we obviously have an issue, we have a challenge we have to deal with in the next fiscal year, and uh, I would want to address that through this. But I suppose, in theory, at least, uh, we could make a decision tonight to uh, just put ourselves a million dollars in the hole next year and spend before the end of this fiscal spend some of that money. Yes, that, yeah, okay. Uh, but the ministry, for its timelines, requires us to file this by the end of February. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And this is just a point of uh, clarification, um, and it may be redundant, and so please apologize in advance. Um, as we know, budgets are always um, our best estimates, and uh, so we're just working on those estimates in order to meet the requirements of the ministerial orders, and. You know, this is kind of a, I think, a serendipitous kind of confluence of factors that came together to provide this money rather than looking at a huge deficit um, and cuts where we can actually perhaps put money where it's needed next year. And uh, considering the classroom operating funds or the classroom um, integration funds, whichever term the government wants to use, I have Trustee um, Leonard to speak next. So I just want to try and provide some clarity here. Um, the motions that are on the floor here tell us on June 30th what the projected budget is going to look like at the end of the fiscal year. That's not saying what we have to do with this. All this is is ministry requirements to say that at the end of the fiscal year, we will have 183 million, 35099, and that's our number. So approving or not approving this doesn't have anything to do with spending that or not spending that. All we're doing is stating that in our best estimate, at the end of the year, our budget is projected to be this. And can I have a nod if that's okay. here? So passing this tonight has nothing to do with those numbers, except that, that this is what the actual number will be, and that's where our surplus will be at the end of the year. But it's not saying what we're doing with it. All it's stating is what we will have on June 30th. And this is a ministry requirement to put to pass these, but in no way reflects what we're going to do with the money or the decision I think that Trustee McNally was concerned about. So I think we don't talk about that for a minute. We just talk about what's in front of us, do what we have to do legally, requirement, and then we can have those discussions um, after the fact. Okay, I have... Um, Trustee Lauren Kahunga, uh, Trustee Noor, and I saw, I think, Diane, uh, Trustee McNally. Can I just ask a further question of Trustee Lauren? Uh, sorry, we're McNally? keeping, okay. just keep okay. it in, no. yeah, it's, Thank it's, you, <coughs> Thank you. Um, it's too bad that uh, we didn't have, you know, couldn't have had the projections and knowing what our surplus was going to be earlier than now because yeah, trying to make a decision about spending eight million dollars in a few months just, you know, obviously is kind of like um, a fly in the sky. 
Um, but I do have some questions about, and I, and I don't know whether this was, you know, discussed at the ops meeting, and forgive me if I missed it, um, but I'm wondering, and I'm looking over on Schedule A1, and I um, would like a little bit of clarification, because what I see here, and what you're telling me up there, doesn't seem to match in my opinion, or my mind, or my way of thinking. So when I take a look at that, we're looking at the total FPE, 18,994,766, and then the total revenue, 165,635,959, bringing it a total, I'm just trying to figure out how all of this is playing. Madam and Chair, the 18,994.766 is the number of full-time equivalent students that we have. Okay. It's not dollars. Okay. The top one, that's what FTE stands for, full-time equivalent oh, students. Right. And, and also as a point of clarification, um, Trustee, we have been saying that um, the administration has been working on building the estimates. This is the first opportunity that they've been able to bring this forward because they've been asking for department heads to be looking at efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this is the earliest they've been able to um, bring that forward. Anyways, please continue with your questions. Okay, so under revenue, total revenue, 100 Million, you um, will find the details of that on Schedule A2 in the fall page yep. over. And so l let me finish my question. So when I look at the expense of 182,285,099, and I look at the balance of, in circles as a deficit of 16,649,140, and then I go down further, another capital asset purchase of 800,000, um, and then down to 17 million. I'm just, when I read that, I, it looks to me as if we have a deficit of 17 million and somehow that ended up getting erased. I just would like some clarification on that. Well, let, so I can rush my voice a little bit. We'll let Deborah respond to that, please. So the final budget document that's before you um, is now all the line items have been recalculated based on the actual September 30th enrollment, September 30th, 2011. So last spring, when the preliminary budget was prepared, it's based on a projected enrollment. This am amended budget bylaw tonight reflects the actual September 30th <coughs> enrollment, and what it also does, it brings forward all of the carry forward amounts from the prior year. So the $17,449,140 was the amount of money that was in the financial statements rolled forward at the end of the year. So it reflects the carry forwards, the school funds that were remaining at the end of the year, the amounts of money that were required to address outstanding purchase order commitments, the amounts that were brought forward to carry the department initiatives, and it also includes the amount of the one-time surplus that was budgeted in the spring to be brought forward into this year. So this budget document now builds in all of the monies that are rolled forward from one year to the next and re is readjusted to reflect the current year enrollment. So the document itself shows balanced budget revenue and expenses. But the presentation that the Secretary Treasurer gave early is that earlier is some of these expenditure line items that are budgeted won't be fully spent. So we're anticipating that at June 30th of 2012, that the amount of cost savings that are contained within these line items are uh, valued at the $8,639,000. So I understand that, Deborah, and thank you for that. But I still see in my, the way I understand financial statements is there was, and I'm wondering, was this a projection of 70, a structural deficit of 17,449,140 and then a transfer over of rollover funds to knock out that deficit? Like, how did that deficit end up getting knocked out, I guess is what I'd like to know. That line represents, if you read the description, budgeted prior year operating surplus appropriation. So when this budget document is built, the various um, carry forward amounts are included um, in, in that line item. So we've, it's showing that our expenditure
expenditure budget, which now brings forward the amounts that were outstanding. So for example, purchase order commitments that were outstanding at June 30th, those values are contained in the expenditure line items. So the revenue to pay for those outstanding commitments is brought forward in the line budgeted prior year operating surplus appropriation. So in the end, we, we end, in the end we're, we're still talking about that 183085099, which is reflective in this motion. And that's why I had those questions. That's the value, the aggregate value of the bylaw. Is that help? Thank you. Um, I have trustee Norman, please. So I'm going back to what I always go back to, and that is that we have the classes in this district that are desperate for financial support for funding. Um, <clears throat> most particularly, I guess at this point, EA support, and um, I, I feel like this, this is an opportunity to discuss the possibility of addressing that between February and June at this point. Uh, that's my, my interest, and I, I, I just know that we have classes where that would be, would provide just significant help for them. Um, it, it yes, you have time. We don't make the final decisions, as has already been said, until April the 16th. This money is just being uh, moved over, and you know we will have the opportunity um, to discuss it. But um, it, remember, if you are wanting to spend this money by June 30th um, to be crossed. What kind of bang for your buck are you going to get in just a few months and still have a deficit next year? So, um, but we have time to think about that. Trustee um, Diane, and then I have Trustee Elaine uh, and Trustee Michael. I'm going down to the list four months because of the hour. Sorry. Your comment answered my question. Thanks. Okay. So, Trustee Leonard. amended 
budget based updated. or updated budget based on the information that we received on September 20th or September 30th. Is that correct? Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, this is for uh, unanimous, um, has to be carried unanimously. I've got one, two, three, <coughs> six. Uh, it's not carried unanimously, um, but keep your hands up so that we know who's voted. Please, um, Trustee Horsman she voted, voted yes. in support. Aye. So actually, who voted in opposition was Trustee Noor and Lauren Kahunga, which is the easier way. Um, so okay. that means that we'll do a uh, full vote. Trustee, uh, Trustee mm -hmm. Leonard. Uh, First. The third reading will be full vote. Yeah. Sorry. Third, third, third reading. reading will be full vote. Right. Third. Can I put the second motion on the floor, please, that the Board of Education is school just 61. Uh, amended annual budget final offer this sheet for 2010-11 in the amount of 183 dollars read for the first time and second time and third time. No. Thank you. First time and second time, sorry. Yeah. Good try. Good try. Okay, all those in favor? Question, we're not buying oh. the third time here. No. no, 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 we're not. It didn't car carry, um, so that's why Trustee Leonard explained it was only for two. So uh, we have, um, who's voting in um, opposite? Bev, what's your vote? Aye. Okay, so we have Nora and uh, Lori Kahunga in. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Oh. Thank you. So, is everybody so no, I think so the only one is, is I'm gonna abstain. which is actually an oxymoron and is a yeah, no, but anyways, it. fine. Um, note that, uh, <coughs> if you would. Note it. So, um, Trustee Leonard. Oh, just to get things rolling here. <laughs> I have just, um, I have two motions that I'd like to put forward, and the reason I'll read them both first is so that you can see my rationale before you jump on the first one or jump on the second one. It didn't really matter which order I did them, but I'll read them first and then see if I get it better. Um, my first motion is to move the projected surplus of $8.639 million to be applied to the 2012-2013 budget shortfall. And I'll explain my rationale if I get a second. And then my second motion would be that the $350,000 projected surplus be applied, applied to class size and composition. Okay, so wait to see. Is there a second or two? Uh, uh, the first motion first is the 8.639 to be for the 2012-2013 budget shortfall. If I get a second, I'll explain. Chair, where did this come from? Is this a motion from the floor? It, yeah. Oh. Yeah, you would have to deal with it from the floor on this. Are those written? And you know? No, not in this case when you're dealing with the budget or just getting the projection. You can deal with those off the floor. And when we did your trustee orientation, remember we did talk about some of this. I stuff. remember all of that. Yes. So, um, is there a second or two Trustee Leonard's motion? You can okay. say it again, please. For first vote, or um, um, move that the projected surplus of 8.639 million be applied to the 2012 2013 budget shortfall. That's the next year. Fiscal year starting July 1st. And we have a seconder. Motions on the floor. Is there any discussion? Uh, Trustee McNally. Can I speak? So, can I speak? Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is I'm the first calm. time I've seen the numbers tonight as well. So the, the, the curve went like that. We had the pink line and the dotted line. We are, have a structural deficit in this district. We've had it for a number of years. We've been very lucky to have been able to move one-time only funding forward for about four or five years now, Secretary Treasurer. Four or five years, we've been moving about $8 million forward so that we didn't have to lay off $8 million for the staff. So I, my personal view is that and I think the board supports this, is that we don't want to look at laying off $8.6 million worth of staff in an upcoming year. So we have to keep covering this $8 million deficit unless we get some ongoing funding which would allow us to, to uh, cover our structural deficit. 
Our structural deficit means we're paying for more staff than we are getting funding for, and each year we continue to do that, which has been great to have more staff in the classrooms, but we have to keep using one-time funding to move forward. So the, the one-time funding that we have there is benefits of 900,000, absentees of 600,000, government grants of 2.5 million, uh, international student programs of 680 million, I could go on, but they are not dollars that you can count on to be spent on staffing. In my personal opinion, we must move them forward to make sure we don't have to cut $8 million worth of staffing next year. Thank you, Trustee Leonard. Uh, I have Trustee McNally. So, um, a couple of questions. If this motion were to pass, does that mean all that money is tied up now and there's no way we could touch it if there was something we really needed to apply to before June? That's question one. Anything, can, any motion can be brought forward. This is something our board has done for what well, past five or six years to, to think about the year coming up as well. And that's why I read my second motion so you would know that I was cognizant of what's happening this year. Let me just follow up on that. I, I'm taking a very simple-minded approach to this because that's what I have to do when it's in this budget. I just feel completely simple-minded about it. So here's the question. If I felt very strongly that there was a need in the school that was going to cost $50,000 and I wanted to discuss it with all my colleagues here and see if we could spend $50,000 to remedy, and believe me, I don't have anything in mind right now. Totally rhetorical. If we had that kind of necessity to put some money before the end of June into a classroom, say, into a situation. Could we still do that if your motion passed, or would that money be so dark for next year? Through you, Madam Chair, the board can make a motion to spend money at any point in time that they like, and as long as the board agrees to it, um, that can be done. What would happen in this case, assuming everything got approved, um, right now, we have an $8,200,000 problem with an $8,600,000 solution, leaving us $350,000 surplus. If you spent $50,000 in your example, that would reduce the $350,000 that we'd have for next year to, uh, as Trustee Leonard said, spend on classroom support. Thanks. For that, um, I just have one follow-up question. And uh, so, the, the eight million dollars a year that we're spending one time of uh, one time only funding over every year for several years, uh, does that only go to making sure that we don't have to lay off staff, or does it go as well to um, making sure that we don't have to make other kinds of painful cuts? Is it only targeting targeted to staff? Well, percent of our budget staff. Good point. Are there, are there, oh, Trustee Lauren Kahuna. I mean, I think, I think it's great that we have, a, you know, a surplus that could be rolled over for next year. Um, I guess my concerns with this is I would like to see um, a budget prepared for next year, and I know that we never know the numbers, and we're finding out this eight million dollars because now we're balancing off our books and all of that but i would really like to see how do we address this issue for next year looking at you know a 182 million dollar budget and that there is a plan put in place so that we're not um, making a decision again at the end of the school year and i know that there's lots of factors um, that can relate to that, but I think that if at least we had a plan in place that we could address some of this rather than always again reacting. I just want to address that. Um, I think it's part of what we've been trying to do with our advocacy um, and why we're looking for high profile advocates and talking to the minister and been writing letters asking for stable funding. It's difficult to make um, to do the planning, we can we can try. Um, there's certainly nothing that um, stops us from doing that, but it's all, always going to be based on, you know, what today's dollars are, and, and you know, the further away you get from that, 
the less accurate you're likely to be. Um, and it would be much easier for us to plan, and that's why we what we're requesting from the minister is stable funding in order that we can do exactly what you're asking for because um, it only makes sense to do so, if that helps you. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, I'll uh, call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, trust and those opposed? Where were you, Diane? I'm going to Pardon me? I'm abstaining. Okay, Diane's abstaining and Trustee Knorr and Lauren Kahunga are um, voting against. Is that all right, just like doing it that way, you know, instead of doing it? Like, yeah, okay, thanks. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. It makes it easier for me. Yeah. Thank you. Trustee Leonard. Um, my second motion is that $350,000 surplus, which we would then be projecting for next year, um, be applied to class size and composition. Do we have a seconder? Thank you. Um, any discussion? Um, Tara. Thanks. I'm just interested in um, how that would be applied to which classrooms and which situations. We, we wouldn't know and we're actually looking that there might be extra money from the <coughs> industry when they're talking about the cost from operating funds. Um, it's just that we know that there's a need and generally speaking when we've had these one-time surpluses, we try to provide them to the classroom. So that would be something that would be de developed, I would think, through uh, with administration and school-based teams as to the needs, the greatest needs. So if this appears a separate budget line item next year? George? Yes. Yes, sir. It was the last time we did. Yeah. And just for clarification, is one time only funding for one year? Yeah. Okay. It's not on one time, unfortunately. <coughs> Diane, did you have? Are there any further questions? I shouldn't have asked you a second. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Now, it was to do with, um, uh, just following up on Tara's question, but how would this money be allocated? And it seems pretty vague. I mean, I think, I know there's no way really to lay it all out right now how it would happen, but it just sounded like, oh, well, in consultation with school-based teams. And I mean, who's going to make the final, who makes the final judgment? There's needs out there. Everybody's got two needs in the class and other things. But there are many, many needs out there. Who has to be Solomon at the baby and not? I want to know how that's been enough. I think we've talked. I think we've talked about that when we say all educational partners need to get together to find solutions because there's many factors that come into this. Uh, you know, to support students in the classroom means supporting teachers in the classrooms. Um, uh, you know, so there would have to be some time spent to determine um, where that money would need to go to. Uh, Trustee Alpha. Well, I think it's really it's really difficult at this point in time to look at the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it's not enough. I think that's obvious. Um, when I look at the binders of oversized or of not oversized classes but numbers over three IEPs, it's immense. And when I look at three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I'm very grateful to see $350,000. I would be even more grateful if it was like $3,500,000. Um, because that would be more along a realistic number um, for addressing composition in our classes. Um, but that said, it's not really possible um, to determine where that money is going to go until we actually see the classes but at the end of September. And um, I think as we're moving through that month, it will most likely become fairly apparent to, the, to um, 
classroom teachers and the schools where the money needs to go. Um, I would really hope that the voices of teachers around the needs in their classrooms would be part of the determination of where the $350,000 would go. But that said, it isn't going to be enough. We know that. Um, but I'm grateful for having something anyway. Thank you, Trustee Alpha. Um, Trustee Leonard. Uh, just to agree with Trustee Alpha, it's not near enough. I would like to it to be far more than, than the motion. Um, but again, I rely on staff to look where the greatest need is, and uh, we have always um, uh, had full confidence in them putting the dollars, the limited dollars that we were able to give them, where the greatest need was, and I, I know that they will do that again. Thank you. Is there any further? Um, I'll call the question. All those Excuse say, me, could you mind oh. reading out the uh, motion again? The, the $350,000 part? Sure. Trustee Leonard? Uh, that the $350,000 projected surplus be applied, applied to class by the composition, and that's for the next year's budget. Did you get it back? I did. I just want to make the comment <coughs> that um, uh, the thing is that it's up to the budget process to decide how any surplus is going to be spent. Personally, I would like to see it go towards class size and composition. But in terms of a motion forwarding it to the, I think it would be better to forward that 350000 to the budget process so that if other trustees or the board decided it went in other directions, that they would be free to do that as part of the budget process. I personally would like to see it go to class size and composition because I think that's where the greatest need is. But I would like to see the motion worded so that the discussion at the budget time is a little bit freer in terms of what's possible. Thanks. Trustee Horsman, uh, Trustee Alpha. Well, um, in response to Trustee Horsman, um, I couldn't support that. Um, I think that if we don't attach this to class size and composition, um, it could easily trickle away like water through sand. There are so many needs in a district this size that it, it could be like watch pouring a cup of water in the sand. You see a, a motion, a tiny bit of dampness, and it's gone. We need to attach it to class size and composition so that we know that even though it isn't enough money, at least some is going to go to support our students. Thank you, Trustee. Could, could I just make a quick comment that it only trickles away if trustees agree to have it trickle away. Um, in fact, uh, I, you know, I'll be surprised if it doesn't go to class size and composition. It's just that we don't usually predetermine what's going to happen at this point because it's not. We, you know, we we invite the public in, we listen to their presentations, and then we we give considered uh, debate and we make a decision. So I'm just saying that it's unusual. Uh, to, to predetermine how money is going to be spent at this point in the budget process. Um, and as I say, if trustees wanted to go to class size and composition, that's exactly where it'll go. Would it help um, to change the wording to, um, never mind, I'm not going there. Um, it's getting late, and uh, Trustee yeah. Ferris. Uh, uh, I'd just like to, I agree with uh, Trustee Martin on this. Uh, I'd like to table this decision budget meeting uh, we can make that decision at that time. I think we need to continue to hear from people about what their concerns are. And, uh, I think there's a, a will around this board to address uh, class issues. And, uh, you know, we've heard, as uh, the chair said, that the government is going to put some money, not enough, but some money towards this issue as well. And if we can but I think it's a debate that still needs to be carried on uh, for the duration of the process. So a move to table if uh, there's no discussion, so uh, um, call the question on whether you want to table this to the uh, budget meeting on April the 16th. All those in favor of tabling? Aye. One, two, three, four, five. Um, so 
Five in favor of tabling. And opposed would be um, Alpha. Um, actually, it's six because did I put my hand up? Okay, let's put our hands up again. I'll count. Are we doing now? I guess. Uh, we're, we're moving. It's the tabling to the April 16th. <coughs> Tabling to the April 16th. I mean, you know, we've already put it out there. Well, never mind. I can't just, speak to just it. record the negatives. There's Trustee McAvoy, Trustee McNally, and Trustee Alpha are in the negative. All the rest are in the positive. Okay. No abstentions. No abstentions. McAvoy, Alpha, and I'm sorry. McNally. Okay. Uh, so moving on. From that work, we've completed that section of uh, that portion of the agenda. Whew. Um, then, <coughs> Trustee Ferris. Uh, I have yet another tabling motion to bring forward. I think that uh, listening to the garble conversation over the last 10 minutes, that uh, we've pretty well come to the end of our uh, end of the line here. I I'd like to see us, uh, you know, if there's any absolutely necessary business and I'll defer to the superintendent. Otherwise, I think we should uh, table this motion. I'm the last one to try to keep people longer, but there is one motion that's time sensitive. Yes. And... Oh, no, F2? And that deals with playgrounds. Oh, I want to say F1 and, and F2. We don't vote tonight. The decision will be made before we get a chance to vote. Do we have agreement to deal with um, F1? F1? Yes. And if we have time by 11, I'd really like to deal with F2 if possible. But definitely F1. So, um, Trustee North, this is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Although it's not ours. It's it's so, uh, we received information from the Secretary Treasurer about all the playgrounds in 2009, 2010, and 2011. And I have spoken with a, a variety of parents who came to me and said, Would you consider bringing a motion forward uh, on our behalf because of the cost involved in the installation? So, for that reason of equity, I'm putting this for motion forward that we make this request. Trustee Leonard. I'd like to speak to you. Okay, and then Deb? I just want a friendly amendment that the chair writes to the Minister of Education instead of staff. Okay. And you're in agreement to that, Deborah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, I know. Trustee Horseman. I'm speaking in favor of the motion. I know how hard it is for parents to raise funds for playground equipment. Personally, I think the ministry should be funding all of the playground equipment. But uh, I definitely think that this motion is fair with the uh, amendment that the board chair do the writing. Yeah. Is there any uh, Trustee Ferris and Trustee Lauren coming back? Uh, I just uh, uh, you chair to perhaps to the secretary treasurer. I'd like to know where, like, to to what pot of money are we directing this question? It used to be called the Jays not years ago. They, they never, through you, Madam Chair, they never told us where they came up with the pot of dollars that they did come up with for this allocation. Uh, so if the minister came up with more money for playgrounds and their budget hasn't been increased, it has to come from someplace. I guess my concern here is that uh, am I asking the minister to give up money for classrooms? pay for a playground. That's my own question. Because if that's the case, I, I'm not supporting the motion. And I'd like to be fairly clear on that. I mean, I don't know. How do you know where it comes from? Well, if they say it's out of the block, that's the problem. Yeah. It's a different funding. You know, it could be out of the block. Or something. Yeah. So I it's think it's just a careful way to ask for it. to make sure that it did not come from the education fund, that it came from whatever fund it was that was not our educational funding block. 
The block should be amended to reflect the cost. It's not fair that some parents have to fundraise and not put money into school improvements, but have to put it in playground and other parents get their playground equipment funded. This is a fairness and equity issue. Are there any other questions? Yeah. I'm just making notes for these letters I have to write and ensure it's not out of education dollars. For future education dollars. Education dollars, now or later. Okay, seeing no further questions, or no further discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Hey, 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 hey. Yes. That's great. You've got time to do the next one. Yeah, I think we do have time to do the next one, which I think is very timely, and this has to do with Trustee McNally's motion. So, yes. I'm removing myself from this because it's... Yes, okay. Okay. Thanks. Trustee McNally? Well, we reached the point in the evening when my eloquence is going to be tried on this, so I'm going to be pretty simple. I think it's pretty much straightforward statement that, at least as far as I'm concerned, and I hope that the rest of my trustee colleagues on the board will agree with me that when we're dealing with our employee groups, and thinking about how to develop a working relationship with them, and I know I'm not the person doing the bargaining, but I'm committed to collective bargaining as a big element of social justice. I really do think that workers need collective agreements in order to have a say in their own employment. So, I'm not going to go any further because I think my explanations will just get less eloquent as I go on. I'm not going to support this motion. I would just clarify that that, again, would be the chair that would write that letter. I'm adding it to my list, and I have Trustee McAvoy and then Trustee Lauren. Well, I'll just repeat what I've said publicly, and that is that the best agreement is a freely negotiated one at the bargaining table. All of us, trustees, teachers, the community, hope for it, and all of us to exercise. So, let's hope that comes to pass. Trustee Lauren Panuga, and then Tara will make a comment. Yes, and I was just going to say that I would vote in favor of it as well, because I don't believe in legislating anybody back to work, and I believe that we need to make sure that it's a negotiated settlement. Thank you. Tara Van Allen. Thank you. I'm very pleased to hear the comments around the table, and I'm sure that this motion passes. Teachers will be very pleased to have the support from this board on this issue. I would suggest you write the letter quickly. The quote-unquote fact finder is releasing their report on Thursday in 2005. It was eight days from the release of the fact finder report to Royal Center Bill 12. The other piece of information I just wanted to share is that the BPTF did call today for the appointment of a mediator, and so if you were interested in supporting that, that would be something to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. And I have Trustee Leonard next. I was just going to say that I think around this table, everybody would have been in favor of this motion all along. A stranger motion would have been that we were in favor of a imposed settlement from the government. So I think all along we've always wanted this. It's reaffirmation. It's reaffirmation, but I know that's what we all wanted all along. Seeing no further discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Yeah, Catherine's associates. Conflict. Because Kathy removed herself. Yes, I would. Yes, thank you. You still know that. So we've actually done pretty well tonight. Oh, I'm sorry, Trustee Lauren. So 
just following up from this motion, I would like to put a motion on the floor that we also send a letter to um, to the Minister of Education, you know, asking for the government to appoint a mediator. Because I, you know, I really believe that 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 follows along with our with our other motion. See, it is getting late, and I know you're tired anyway. You didn't motion, to motion to adjourn. And the, the rest, there's only. Uh, Excuse me, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Trustee Horseman. Are we going to refer F4, 5, and 6 to off? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do we have to vote on that? Uh, there's a motion. Well, we've already had a motion to adjourn, but we. Um, Referral of F4, F5, F6 to OPS. I would move that. Uh, no, Trustee Norm? Yeah, that's fine. So we'll refer those to OPS. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. You take care of it. Thank you. And we'll see you next day.